this present hopefully enjoying the presentation about farmers markets. It's always nice to talk about food while people are actually eating food. <laughs> um, and so definitely a big thank you to Kathy for organizing our meal that we're able to share and the people who were preparing the meal to um, bring it today. I, the research I'm going to present today is part of a grant called the University of South Carolina Cancer Prevention and Control Research Network, which is funded by the CDC. The CPCRN is one of the special interest projects that the Prevention Research Center program of the CDC uh, supports. So it's, a, it's an example of one of the network uh, special interest projects of CDC. So like Sue said, I've just recently joined the faculty here at CASE. I came in July of 2013 and I'm getting ready to celebrate my one year anniversary in Cleveland. It's not a completely foreign place for me. Both of my grandparents grew up in Cleveland and I came here a lot as a child and you know, also as a young adult coming to visit family. Although I never actually, I lived in Cleveland when I was about four years old for a year. So uh, I, I have some roots in the city, but I'm definitely in a learning mode. Just to get a feel for who's in the audience right now, how many of you are at Case? Okay, majority of the folks are at Case. And what about outside of Case? Good, a decent number. Where are you from? Uh, we work for the Green Corps program with the Food and Botanical Garden. Okay, Green Corps. And in the back? Uh, also Green Corps. Yeah. Green Corps? <laughs> and you? Uh, I work for an organization called Enhancement Ministry, the Safe Haven Program. Was suspended and uh, expelled children from the United States. Excellent. Well, I'm happy to see you, you outsiders of Case Western um, coming to. Sometimes it's difficult to come to a presentation on a university campus. Parking issues, and we really try at the PRC to make it as accessible as possible uh, when we do you know, any of the work that we're doing. So, thank you for being here. My presentation agenda today is to start off with talking about uh, why does it make sense to integrate farmers markets into healthcare <coughs> delivery systems. That's what we did in the project in South Carolina called the Right Choice Fresh Start Farmers Market. So give a little bit of background on that um, and how we formed the market. And then I'm going to give you some uh, outcomes that we found as a result of this farmers market ranging the entire ecological spectrum from individual, relational, community, <coughs> institutional, and societal level. I'm trained as a community psychologist, so when I think about creating, creating change, no matter what it is, you always have to think about multiple levels of influence. And really, it comes down to creating new systems and systems level change. When I thought about this presentation today, I actually added on a, I titled the talk originally Market to Mouth, and then I added a tagline as I developed the presentation, coming full circle, because what you'll see in our research is that we went, started off with an individual level outcome, we moved all the way out to a societal level outcome, and then we came back to individual level outcomes that um, once you start to have systems level change, you probably then need to go back and think about how do individuals take advantage of these new opportunities. Um, we'll talk about the importance of building demand along with supply. And then probably most unique to this seminar is we will have some interaction. Um, I, have a, I am definitely a participatory researcher. I think knowledge should be co-produced. I don't think you should just listen to me. So I want to hear a little bit about what you uh, think in terms of your response to some of the information I'm giving today. So hopefully we'll have some time for that. <clears throat> Pretty much anywhere you go in mainstream media, if you pulled up a website, a newspaper, you're going to find something about healthy eating, healthy foods, and the importance of food as medicine. So here's an example. This is an article that was published in April in the Atlantic Magazine, which is an excellent article if you've not read it. Um, but just one example of many that highlights that food is one of the most important uh, factors we need to think about when we're talking about overall health, um, but particularly around chronic disease prevention. 
Here's a study that came out um, also in April, a large study. The title is called Treat or Eat, Food Insecurity, Cost-Related Medication, Underuse, and Unmet Needs. It's a large sample, almost 10,000 people, nationally representative. And they found that one in three people with a chronic illness are making a choice between food, medications, or both. So when we're talking about health, we have to also think about food. And that in the research world, again, just a smattering of papers, oftentimes the focus on food and health comes into two broad categories. On the one hand, we see a focus on food and health around lack of access to food or food insecurity and various health outcomes. On the other, we see this overconsumption of food and health outcomes. So I'm not going to go into any of these papers right now. I just want to make the point that right now, it's very mainstream to be focusing on this relationship, but it goes back to the roots of medicine. So here's Hippocrates, we all heard of him, father of Western medicine, and he was one of the um, first people to make this connection, or at least record it. Probably there, were, there was somebody else who said it before him. Um, that made the statement of, you know, food is medicine. And that it should be considered a part of our story when we're talking about health and well-being. For me, though, all of those data and all of those stories are important, but the most powerful one was when, about a decade ago, I was conducting a photo voice project with women who had children in Head Start preschool programs. And if you're not familiar with PhotoVoice, it's a data collection method, a participatory method, that integrates photography and group discussion. And so the women were charged with taking pictures of things that influenced their child's risk for obesity. And one woman took a picture of tomatoes, and when she asked the group to describe what that picture meant for her, she said that this represented the dress she sees in the window something she always wanted but never could have. And at that moment, I was, in a, I was a doctoral student. It was actually my first year of being a doctoral student. And I was blown away um, that, uh, her, by her response to that. And if, a decade ago, there was nary a paper on food environments and health, right? This was a new concept. And of course, people living the experience knew this reality. But many of us researchers, most of us researchers, had not uncovered that. And now there's a plethora of research about the relationship between food environment and health. Here we can see a map. This is um, a map of food deserts in Cleveland neighborhoods. Some people have said that all of Cleveland is a food desert. And that's questionable whether or not it is. Right here, this is the brighter the pink shade, the, the greater the distance between the neighborhood and a grocery store or a supermarket. So there's quite a bit of pink in the central area there. In my own research, we looked at food environments in Nashville, Tennessee, in an urban area. We were specifically looking at food environments around, um, boy, around uh, public housing communities. And we found that food deserts are not deserted in the sense that there's nothing there. And, and that a lot of people in the field really question the language of desert um, because they're not deserted. And some people said, well, maybe a better term is food swamp. And that's something we could talk about in the um, discussion time, food swamp in terms of swampy in the bad, but deserted in the good. But I've talked to a lot of people who are ecologists and said, deserts are not, des deserts are ecosystems that have a lot going on. And so even to use the term desert, um, you know, it, it's a misnomer. Uh, there, my point is not in the language here, but rather in what's present in uh, food deserts. So you can see, again, it's not lack of access of any store. Majority of the stores are convenience stores. Some smaller local markets like this. And then, um, you know, a very small number of supermarkets. This is one study in one community. We could look at hundreds of studies out there, 150 papers we could pull, and we would see similar uh, distribution of food environment. In terms of quality of the food sold, we went inside every store, and we actually created a quality score. You can see in a convenience score, 
It has a negative quality score, meaning it has a plethora of very bad things for you and very few good things present within the store. Similar for a local market, um, whereas a supermarket really does have a fairly wide selection. Just to um, illustrate a point here, I want to look at the maps, and we can see there, you know, in terms of greater Cleveland, the areas that have fairly high rates of food desert or low access to food stores, and then here again, looking at data coming out of the Prevention Research Center where we mapped uh, prevalence of obesity in Cleveland, and we can see that the areas that have the highest rates of obesity are those same areas where there's the lowest access to food stores within the community. And these data, and I'm not saying, I'm not presenting a correlation, but I'm just trying to illustrate a point that a lot of the people in the literature are saying. There's a relationship between the food environment and health outcomes such that people with low access to healthy foods in their neighborhood often have poor diets, higher rates of chronic disease, higher rates of obesity. Um, and we've seen this pattern among both adults and children. So this has led the field of public health to uh, what I call the field of dreams model of uh, change. And this idea of, you know, if you build it, will they come? I mean, if the, the real problem is not having a store, actually, that's a pretty easy so problem to solve. It's not an easy, it is a very complicated, but it's easy in the sense of, oh, well, we just need to put in a store. And I'm here to argue today that I think that is an extremely um, insufficient uh, theory or understanding of the problem. And just give you a couple of examples. So when I was doing work in Columbia, I worked very closely in a public housing community. Before I got there, actually, the public housing community developed a brand new, <coughs> nice grocery store in the community called Columbia Food Fresh Market. And that grocery store failed within a year and a half and really at a one-year mark was pretty much dead. That's a huge financial investment they made and to have it fail like that. Right now, but when I left South Carolina a year ago, they were talking about making it into a, a greenhouse to grow food because they didn't know what to do with the space. Uh, in a study out of the UK, the UK was well ahead of the US in terms of food environment research. Uh, they did a study in a food desert where they developed a new grocery store. And less than 50% of the residents in the community actually used the new store when it was placed in their community. And my team's research in South Carolina and also out of South, uh, Seattle, we found that people pass one or more stores in their neighborhood to reach their primary store for food shopping. So just having spatial access is not enough. In our work, um, and this really builds off of a series of qualitative studies with diverse populations in urban and rural areas, we have come up with a framework of nutritious food access that includes five different dimensions. And spatial temporal is one, so you do need to have it. It's necessary but not sufficient. Other domains, economic, service delivery, social, and personal elements of food access. And in the um, study that the Right Choice Fresh Start Farmer's Market study, we actually built on that framework to develop a farmer's market at a federally qualified health center. So our, when we developed the model, we, we thought about intervention elements at each of those domains. So here's a picture of one of our vendors at the farmer's market. We're a very small farmer's market, only five vendors, um, and they get about 200 customers a week. I was just looking yesterday at national data uh, for farmer's markets, and the average farmer's market has 50 vendors. So we are very small compared to the average farmer's market in the United States. And that was in 2006. So if you're not familiar with South Carolina, you probably are familiar with the Charleston area, or maybe Hilton Head, Myrtle Beach. Uh, Orangeburg is located right in the center of the state. Orangeburg is a, in, in, on this map here, you can see all of the FQHCs, or federally qualified health centers in South Carolina, 
There were a total of 156 at the time of our study. In Ohio, just as comparison, there's 148. There's a lot in the country, over 7,000. That will continue to expand uh, because of the Affordable Care Act. The reason why we focused on FQHCs in this study was because we're thinking about systems change. And it's very effective to think about systems change in systems. And FQHCs are systems. Most of the time, there's one uh, core you know, FQHC that <laughs> operates several satellites. So they're a system. And then, of course, there's the national network. Uh, Orangeburg is a, what they call a micropolitan community, so it's not rural in the sense it's a one stoplight community, but it is uh, a relatively small town. It does have two universities, two historically black colleges, uh, Claflin, which is a private university, and South Carolina State. It has a technical school. Um, it's majority African American, low median income compared to the um, state of South Carolina higher percent poverty, and very high rates of obesity and diabetes. At the time of our study, uh, Orangeburg, I think, was ranked 41 out of 44 in terms of its county health ranking. So there are a lot of assets in Orangeburg, but there's also a lot of concern when it comes to some of the health issues. We knew starting off that in to cre you know building on that theory of food access or the framework of food access that social access was really important and community had to buy in and have ownership of the project and so we began we formed a memorandum of agreement with the site we held a community visioning meeting we then formed an advisory council hired a, a farmers market manager who's a community member actually we're on our third market manager for this season right now the fourth season um, but the prior managers have stayed on as advisory council members it operated um, for the first season in june of 2011 it went june to october and june 6 of this year it will start its six or its fourth season so uh, that, to me, is just so exciting to see, you know, I've, I'm no longer even in South Carolina. Um, and really, I stepped out in, a, in an active leadership role in 2012. Um, and then we did a lot of customer feedback, uh, customer satisfaction was built into the model of uh, operation at the market. So I'm going to present... A few of the outcomes we found through a series of studies conducted at this farmer's market. The first study is focused on individual level change and specifically looking at changes in fruit and vegetable <coughs> consumption. And I come to this research as a community psychologist and very interested, very strong background in community organizing and community development. And one of the mantras in community organizing is you meet people where they're at. And we knew that if we wanted to create systems level change of integrating farmers markets into healthcare delivery systems, we needed to meet our partners with the data that they wanted. And this is what they wanted to know. There was really no other outcome we could give them that would be important. If we can't at least give you some information about the influence of this on diet. And one of our, uh, in partnership with the FQHC, the medical director, she was particularly interested in diabetic patients. If you saw, remember from the slide earlier, 15% of the people in um, Orangeburg County have diabetes. At this health center, it was extremely high. <clears throat> so we focused on a diabetic sample recruited from the health center they all had the farmer's market at their health center, and they also received a $50 um, free money, basically. It was not a matching program to shop at the market. And we looked at fruit and vegetable consumption over time, over the course of the season, beginning, middle, and end, using a pretty good screener uh, from the National Cancer Institute. And the two main results that we found was, one, there was a dose-response relationship between farmer's market use and improvements in fruit and vegetable consumption, such that those people who came more often were more likely to improve their diet. That's a good sign. 
Um, and secondly, we saw that people who were improvers were more likely to rely on their financial incentive than uh, to purchase foods from the market. So they never dipped into their pocket. They actually only paid for food with that $50 incentive. That was counterintuitive. My theory was if you had to dip in your pocket, you're really now making the change. But what our data show is for a, a select population, and particularly a low-income population, <coughs> cost barriers are huge. And until that barrier is removed, we really have nothing to talk about. And again, this comes back to when I was doing research in Nashville as a part of my dissertation research. A man came to the market, elderly man who was struggling financially. He looked at the food, and I said, why don't you buy something? He said, I know the peaches are worth the price, but I just don't have the money to buy it. So cost is a major barrier for many people. The next thing that we looked at was that relational element of an uh, ecological <coughs> model. And specifically, we were interested in changes in patient and provider communication that could be facilitated by having a farmer's market on site. And again, we used the same sample, and there were two produce prescription programs. One of them was provided uh, a $1 coupon by the providers in the clinic, and the other one actually was developed by the health center after we started. They got really excited. Through the diabetes management education program, they created a $5 coupon. So we had a different amount, and there was also a slightly different delivery. The way the diabetes manager um, organized it, she would hold her classes on Friday, the day of the market, so they could come to the class, get their coupon, and go shop. Well, that coupon got used way more than the $1 coupon. Um, and we looked at patient changes in the patient-provider communication relationship. The main finding for us was that it wasn't the conversation that happened when you got the coupon, but rather seeing your provider role modeling the behavior of shopping at the farmer's market was what patients said was most important to them. So it was not just do what I say, but do what I do. It also created a new space for patients and providers to interact outside the four walls of the clinic and, and perhaps in a way where you might be on more equal playing ground. Providers are very recognizable. We can see you're probably a provider back there. Providers wear a uniform that kind of sets them apart. So even in a farmer's market space, you, can tell you can't tell patients, but you can definitely tell providers. We also were interested in social relationships that might uh, form through farmers, consumers, and providers interacting with one another at the market. This study emerged, again, doing a participatory study. When you spend time in the community, new questions rise up. And we can tell there's a lot going on in the social dynamics of the market space. So we, uh, actually, one of my doctoral students um, developed a, an ethnographic study where we collected observations over 18 weeks at the market. And um, we found some of, some of the important factors influencing these social interactions. Some of them were non-human. So for example, having a picnic table or park benches where people could sit and interact and spend time together at the market. For us in South Carolina, having boiled peanuts sold at the market. If, has anyone ever eaten boiled peanuts? Yes. So they are an extremely social, it's kind of like having popcorn or something. I mean, it's a very social food. People sit, you know, stand around the pot while you're waiting for the peanuts to boil, so it takes a little bit of time. They're very, very good. They're probably not that healthy, depending on how much salt you put on them. Um, but boiled peanuts were a major a non-human actor at the market in terms of facilitating social interactions. We also looked at um, you know, just a couple of other things that might be uh, mediating a relationship between a farmer's market intervention and a behavioral outcome around deal making that happens. So your dollar at a farmer's market, and particularly your food subsidy, probably goes farther at the market space than, in a you know, than at uh, Giant Eagle, for example. Camaraderie was an, provided an incentive to return to the market, and this informal recipe exchange were, um, provided opportunities to enhance food preparation techniques. So none of those were structured. These all happened organically in the space. 
So then we were interested in community level changes in economic opportunity for farmers as a part of this market. And when we did our visioning meeting in the very beginning, the community made it clear that this wasn't just about health, uh, in human health, it was also about economic viability and vitality for the community. And so um, we developed an intervention, it's a food assistance matching program called Shop and Save, that provided a $5 matching coupon for a, up to one matching coupon for each if you spent $5 at the market. So if you spent five in a SNAP or food, food stamps, then you could get a $5 match. If you spent 10, you still only got five. And we looked at the influence of this intervention, Shop and Save, on farmer's market revenue and use of food assistance. In, uh, in total, we had 336 people enroll in the program. Most were women, African American, and patients at the health center. All forms of food assistance at the market increased between 10 and 25 percent, and overall, the market revenue increased. Um, you can see from about 14,000 to almost 16,000 dollars. So that some of that increase would be expected just from the first to second year. Uh, but we definitely saw a much more sustained use of the market throughout the season, you know, from the first, from the second year compared to the first uh, when we had the incentive program. So in terms of institutional level change, we sustained the operation. Again, I left in uh, 2012 and 2013, and now we're starting 2014 season. I went to the market in 2013, right before I was moving to Cleveland. I wanted to go there one last time, get some boiled peanuts. And um, this, the volunteer coordinator, who was a community member, came up to me, introduced herself. She wanted to see if I would like to be a volunteer. She had no clue who I was. To me, that was one of the greatest signs that we had been successful as a participatory project. Um, the ownership had shifted to the community. We had sustained implementation of our advisory council. The, there's been a transition of leadership. They now have, uh, you know, appointed various roles. And this is the email I got about a week ago. Good morning. This is from the new chair of the advisory council, Minnie. The agenda is attached for the upcoming meeting. I pray that each of you will be able to attend because it's an important meeting for us. The farmers market scheduled to open. Blah blah blah. But this was. To me, again, one of the signs that we had been successful in this project. This project is completely viable without our engagement uh, from a research perspective. The farmer's market has sustained commitment by key staff, the health educator, the facilities manager, and then the farmer's market manager. And they've also been very successful at seeking additional funds. Um, and you can see here, most recently, actually in March of this year, they submitted a community food project grant. It was the third time they've tried to submit this. It's a USDA grant. And that was one of the biggest lessons for me as a participatory researcher was to see that I had to really step back. I mean, and I can't do for others what people need to do for themselves. And that last round, the third round, the first two, we wrote, we worked on, it wrote the grant essentially for the community and it had to be submitted through the community but grants.gov became the barrier. And the last time I said, you guys have the grant, they had to get a 100% match on the grant, which meant if they spent $1, they'd get a $1 match. A $100,000 grant, they had to get a $100,000 match. And by golly, I'm getting calls after hours on Saturday, hey, hey, help, we need this from you. And that, again, was a sign that, um, you know, the community had really taken on that ownership. And a lesson to me that I had probably done too much earlier um, in terms of, uh, you know, carrying weight with this project. And then lastly, in terms of societal <coughs> level change, uh, we always knew our goal was to have this be an exemplar. We couldn't do this work across the entire state. It takes tremendous <coughs> effort. But we wanted to create policy change to support the work that we were doing. So we started telling our story from the very beginning through the creation of a documentary. And we shared that at community forums, film festivals. We actually won a film award. You can watch the film called Planting Healthy Roots. It's on YouTube. 
In the end, uh, in 2012, in the near the end of our second season, when we were starting to see the results of the Shop and Save program, we knew Shop and Save was working. And we knew there had to be policy to support this because we didn't have funds to keep it up for the next year. So we went to some advocates, um, poverty rights advocate, and actually an advocate with AARP, and we said, what do we do? We didn't have complete data. But we had enough to say, this is working. And they started to get excited about it. And, uh, but they said, please step away. Please don't do anything, you researcher. Let us take it from here with the General Assembly. The only thing that I did is I did write one op-ed in about February of 2013, which was uh, our General Assembly meets in South Carolina from Jan January to June. And it, at the time, the governor was very interested in stick approaches to obesity prevention and wanted to put forward a proposal to limit what people could buy with SNAP. Mm -hmm. And I said, we have data, there's no evidence that that works, but we have data to show a carrot approach works. And so I wrote one op-ed to support this, and I do think it gave some of the advocacy um, groups some fuel <coughs> for their um, argument. But ultimately, bipartisan support to pass statewide double bucks program, as far as I know, it's the only state paid incentive program in the country. And if you think about South Carolina as being the role model for this, you know that's not normally where they <coughs> rise in terms of uh, their leadership. So right now, uh, the Right Choice Fresh Start Farmers Market is an implementa pilot implementation start for the rollout of this new program. And, and they'll actually, um, they're one of 10 sites that will have the rollout. So ultimately, when I think about this work, it is about systems change. It's about shifting the way that a community makes decisions about policies, programs, and the allocation of its resources. And ultimately, in the way it delivers its services to citizens. Systems change involves multiple components, shifting interactions and community psychology, we call that social regularities, altering the whole through shifts through underlying choices, and then shifting the manner in which systems provide feedback to itself. And so in our, that idea of coming full circle, the lesson that we learned in this study was as we started to change the system, we came back to the question of, well, what are people doing with the food that they buy at the Right Choice Fresh Start Farmer's Market? We really had no idea. And I would get asked that question a lot when I presented on this study. And so, you know, it became clear that there was, it, once you can increase supply through systems change, you then have to have corollary efforts to think about improving demand. And so the, the Market to Mouth study was conducted last summer. It's a cross-sectional interview study where we recruited people on a Friday market day, and then we interviewed them the following Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday about what they bought the last Friday. We enrolled 121 customers. Our response rate was 65%. So we had a number of people from Friday to Tuesday, their number was no longer working, uh, wrong number, you know, whatever. So there's a lot, or we just could not connect. You know, no answering machine, you'd call, we called multiple times, but we needed to get them within a certain time frame. 88% of the sample had some form of food assistance, 90% identified as African American, 93% women. About half had shopped at the market in the past. Uh, it's an older group, eight, uh, average age of 57 years. And overall, these 121 people bought 480 fruits and vegetables, so about four per person. The most popular <coughs> food bought by these people um, bought by at least 20% were peaches, muscadine grapes, plums, tomatoes, bananas, and I'll come back to that in a minute, sweet potato, watermelon, peanuts, and apples. How many of you think we grow bananas in South Carolina? <laughs> we did not grow bananas in South Carolina. We were, our vendor policy, again, negotiated in partnership with the community, was not a local-only farmer's market. Our policy was a 50-50 rule, meaning you needed to have grown 50% of what you sold, and it was what the community wanted. 
They wanted bananas mm -hmm. at the market. They wanted oranges. That's what the community wanted, and I really wasn't in any position to be arguing about that. So why did people um, purchase or prepare foods from the market? Here's a slide. The green are the why purchased, and the uh, blue are the why prepared. And we had some qualitative responses in a survey. And we coded those and, and identified these themes. So there are 10 themes, preference, uh, food preparation plan, health for family, quality, routine, price, variety, tradition, and support farmers. So you can see here the top four for reasons why you purchased. So for preference, number one was they loved or liked the food. And if you think about the discourse we hear around fruits and vegetables, oh, people don't like it. Love, I mean, how many times did we code love? Love is like, it's the most common code in our, co in our data. Um, food preparation. There was a desire to make fast and easy foods like salads, snacks, and smoothies or juices. But the key being fast and easy. Health. There was a belief that these foods would address specific health issues like cholesterol, prenatal development, or digestive functioning. And for family, definitely a strong belief that, you know, what was driving their behavior was either for their children or for their grandchildren. In terms of food preparation plans, again, preference and food preparation plans. So they may have a recipe they wanted to make. Um, but the other thing, and this was different than why they purchased, but for preparation was this idea of tradition. And this is a much more entrenched behavior if you think about changing people's behavior. You may be able to get somebody to buy something new, but to get them to prepare it differently might be a, a much more difficult task to, un, to take on. So we heard a lot in terms of why they prepared a certain food one way. As, you know, I always eat it this way. There's no other way to do it. This is how I was brought up. So I'm on time. So what I would like to do now is I... For me, this, there's not a lot out there in terms of how do we use evidence to inform some of the marketing strategies that we use at farmers markets, particularly to recruit in or to improve demand among low-income consumers. We know in Cleveland that even though we have, you guys have everything that I just said you have here. And yet, the use of any of these programs is still relatively low, right? Compared to you know, the total eligible population. So what could we do in terms of developing community communication strategies that are audience-centered, particularly for low-income consumer, to encourage farmers market use? And in these little packets, There'll be a group. I want you to think about what kind of message could you create that would build on this concept of preference? Like, what would be a slogan you could create? Or food preparation plans. You saw, like, what kind of recipe could you advertise at a market, given people's interests? Or, you know, hell, family tradition. So, I have five groups. There's more people here than I actually thought would be here, which is wonderful. But kind of pair off. I'm going to go by the rows and come together. And if you have group one, you actually have in your packet a little bit of information. Um, some people won't like interaction. And you can just sit and or vote. But if you want to stay and participate, the reason I'm doing this also, just as a little um, preview, is that this focus on communication is actually going to be a major focus of the new core research of the uh, Prevention Research Center for Healthy Neighborhoods in our Fresh Link. Uh, research portfolio. So this is not just a futile activity. It's just to start to begin to jog our thoughts about uh, how we can communicate these types of interventions or these types of programs to uh, populations that we are interested in serving. So I'll give you guys group one. And then we'll come back together and share and discuss. I like what you have. So in ten 
15 minutes and we'll come back together. I want any kind of Yes. the local markets so it's actually very like now, and I think, I mean, the hard part is the what would you use about obviously what food would get out of the grind? Just put it aside for example. Yeah, yeah. So, the real cost of is actually that price, but we're used to paying for just whatever. So you each of you are the same thing, so everybody else is the same thing. Are we supposed to write on it? Yeah, you want to write down your little, what's your communication going to be that you're going to have concept so to have so other than salads you can tell me this so we work with Darcy so it's a dollar match or we have up to ten. So in order to have all the other and one of the components of the food is something like the for us to shake our um where it'll be like a pull out menu and then a nice thing like to make a stir or we had something like smoothies and salads but we had to cut it down because it was so much said stir fry and like there's one of the golden like one pot meal so like what well so how we cut it up so we thought like not only is it a must be kind of like basic food preparation skills because we try stir fry cut up in advance. You have to cut things up relatively the same size, but you have to put things in at different times so one of them is overcooked. So, um, I guess my, my idea would be for to put it in fast, and it could be like a one pot dish. You don't have to worry about size or things. But I don't know if that's something that you guys agree with, but I'm throwing it out there. Because maybe if I hear otherwise, we can put something else in the food guide. Um, Locally, cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 
Oh, I'm writing it on, on here. Um, I have extra paper. I wonder if it might be, you know, there's this whole push right now for like Cleveland, and this is funny, so that's how this most people who do you lose the Oh, well, I guess I'm going to do whatever you buy this season, so it's going to be a little summer. What are some of the preferences? Yeah, and something around that. Well, you know, you know, right? Maybe like one very far back. I guess that's the most fun of the most healthy videos to try. Yeah, but they fail. Usually it's on the dry with their and those could be some across the city or county, and they could be all the people as people water You know what I mean? So, maybe. Yeah. 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 Y
Corn. 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 <laughs> corn. We can sell it on the cob, but of course to pop it, I guess you have to get it off the cob. <laughs> so we thought about slogans around popcorn, because popcorn is a food like boiled peanuts in South Carolina, that people tend to sit around and eat and hobnob with each other. That's what you want. So we thought king of pop, which mm. is a, a good slogan, mm. um, and for the African American community, most people associate king of pop with who? President Jackson. Jackson. <laughs> so, um, that's great. <laughs> and then, uh, we had the food preferences one, and we were thinking about, we saw a lot of collards on the 79 um, and 60, and Lily's sister, Lily Ward, came up with um, Kale is the New Collard. Kale is the like. New Collard. I love it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Because we sell, I probably sell 40 pounds of collards a week. Okay. Like a lot. <laughs> collards I, are popular. Yeah, I tried it. I mean, we definitely push them to not use like turkey necks and bacon fat in them. They still them probably. Yeah. But um, I I have encouraged them to buy kale. And they do they do try it. They always try it. Um, <laughs> so king of pop and kale is the new collar. Okay. All right. Your garden. Sorry, I'm Jerry. It's on E79. That point. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm just no, sure you stop by then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how about this group? So we were group number two, and we were talking about SD cards, and it turns out this is very relevant, because I didn't get your name. Erica. Erica is yeah. working on some recipes in, in a project she's doing. So um, we discussed the idea of um, maybe putting recipes into a theme. Um, it was a bit of a struggle to sort of figure out exactly the theme, but maybe pulling in the idea of um, embracing Cleveland, a lot of the things going on right now about this is Cleveland and believe in Cleveland and those sorts of things that may be a uniting theme to, to do something that felt urban. And we were saying it as a contrast to maybe South Carolina, one of the differences here is that much more urban environment, um, maybe embracing that in a way, is a, putting the recipes into that a kind of a collection. And we talked about people coming from different cultural backgrounds, they're going to prepare the food. <coughs> how they're used to, but perhaps you could present recipes, maybe even two on a card, with the same vegetable, something that's in season. So for instance, um, we talked about greens too. So if it was greens, maybe um, one way of presenting, you know, cooking them might be more of an African American from the South, and another, somebody suggested like an Indian recipe, um, so that it would be uh, showing you lots of variety. Yeah, and also highlighting that this is Cleveland, where all these tastes. Yeah, and we, this is all part of our rich heritage here and everything. Taste of taste of Cleveland. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we a new slogan, but that's a good one. <laughs> all right, great. Okay, how about that group back there? Okay, we, we have group number three. three. <laughs> we, we had to come up with a slogan doctors and other health care providers can use that builds on the theme health. So, me, I am a breast cancer survivor, 15 years, and my daughter. I am originally from North Carolina, and there, most people there have some type of cancer mm -hmm. in North Carolina. So, we came up to Either be fresh, be healthy, or eat fresh. What's good for you, good for the community and environment. Great. Excellent. Thank you. How about this group back there? We were the family group um, and came up with some great on-site activities with our communication revolving kind of around um, Come to the farmer's market for a fun day with your family. We'll have lots of activities that you can engage in, including um, some recipe sharing, some recipe altering, um, adding new types of vegetables and fruits into the your <coughs> standing recipes. We talked about um, gardening activities and kind of learning where your food comes from, arts and crafts, chalk drawings, um, colorings of fruits and vegetables. Um, food tasting, blindfolding, trying different fruits and vegetables. Um, so the child is kind of learning, what do I really like? We talked about um, fake money and you know being able to actually the child actually learning about how to do the exchange and the purchase and purchasing themselves the foods that they want to eat. Um, and this, oh, and then uh, some types of activities revolving around the recipes um, being 
what are some fun recipes that a child can actually do? So like ants on a log or something where the, the, the kid is kind of playing with the food and having some fun with it, um, but also learning that it's good for them. And, and think great. Excellent. All right. <laughs> Lots of ideas. <laughs> okay, back there, you guys. Okay. Uh, well, I was going to say, based on uh, trying to uh, utilize tradition um, as a way to kind of sell food, and um, we kind of discussed uh, utilizing, uh, trying to recruit a lot from the community, um, getting people involved, um, and uh, having like a, a food cooking demonstration where they can cook traditional foods um, represented of the community, but doing it in a fashion that's um, more healthy, and then also giving out recipes. Um, that's kind of a way to. Um, have people using more traditional foods in a healthy manner. Um, and yeah, just uh, mostly just trying to get community involvement and vendors from the community, which especially includes like having so many urban farms, it's uh, pretty easy to do. Excellent. Great. Well, I really appreciated that. Um, you guys' thoughts <coughs> on how we can build on some of the themes that emerge from the Market to Mouth study and actually put them into um, programming within farmers markets, hopefully uh, ultimately to increase demand. So that is really the end of my presentation. Um, and now just open it up for any questions that you have or comments. Yes. I think to keep the prices down in the market to, to because so those that I visit are are much more expensive than grocery stores. Yeah, and that's what we said earlier. And one of the challenges with farmers markets, and, and you know, when we think about systems change, I and mean, we have to think about how food is subsidized in our country, and why certain foods cost a certain amount, why processed foods, for example, are cheaper than you know whole food products. So, I mean, like the farm bill that just passed, the farm bill is the major federal policy that influences the cost of food in our country. And traditionally, the Farm Bill has not funded, provided any subsidy for the production of, you know, fruits and vegetables. And we've really subsidized things like corn and soybeans and, and other things that are processed into things like fruit, high fructose corn syrup or whatever, but they're not eaten whole, um, you know, as a product. So part of the reason why a farmer's market cost is more expensive is because it's more realistic what the what the cost of food is, mm -hmm. whereas in the grocery store a lot of the cost is has been subsidized by the government, and then of course we pay for it again when we pay for all the health issues related to that food. So, you yeah. okay? <laughs> so I I've, I've been looking up to see parts of this presentation before, and I am kind of remembering some other reactions that people had to it. And one thing that came to mind is, is this whole upstream, addressing issues upstream. And so looking at this one more time, I keep thinking, are we engaging enough with the groups that are doing a lot of work on poverty? And I'm pretty sure I mentioned this last time you had presented, but groups like Policy Link, if anyone here is familiar, are starting to get really Tell interested. Tell people what Policy Link is. So Policy, um, is a, Policy Link is a national organization. They work on equity issues, most, most um, mostly using policy as a way to curb poverty. Um, and they've been really, really interested in the food, food system movement, food security, food access. And I feel like if we can kind of meet them halfway where the food, the organizations doing food security and food access work and start maybe working concurrently to do poverty work. So I feel like we need to, this work is very much needed and like these these micro interventions, but they need to be done in kind of coordination with policy or poverty work. And whether that's policy or programming, it just needs to happen at the same time. Yeah. Because I mean, the treatery things, these are all, it's all upstream poverty yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, so, and another thing is that I feel like seeing this for the second time, I just thought about clothing as well. And when you're trying to buy clothing that's made, you know, in a sustainable way or is manufactured in America or is manufactured by small mills, you're paying infinitely more than when you go to a 
a mall or traditional cloth clothing retailer. So it's like until, um, I, and when people see the true cost of goods everywhere, not just in food, but in clothing and other other things that are subsidized and that are determined by these big policy pieces, I think you'll have a little bit more action, but I feel like for the most part we're so separated from the true costs of the goods that we consume and the services that we consume. So and that, I mean, like farmers markets have emerged as these critiques of the, you know, capitalist yeah. productionist food system. So how do we create, you know, linkages between producers and consumers? And, you know, they provide one space, but you're exactly right that, you know, the, when we talk about systems change, I mean, I talked about a micro system. It's a big system, but it is a, a micro system. Yeah. Uh, but we, I agree, we need to be having other people at the table who, for example, who are more focused on poverty yeah. elimination. We have great poverty research on our case, so. Yeah. Yes? Uh, this may be a really naive question, but it strikes me that many of the farmers markets that I'm familiar with in the area, you know, Shaker Square maybe, or the one that come, that's uh, Wednesdays at the Koenig mm -hmm. in the summers. Um, they're, I, I don't know, I, I see the people who come to them typically are the people who work in those areas, at least the clinic definitely. Um, and I don't know if the impression that people have of them is that, that they are sort of high-end fresh sort of thing <coughs> as opposed to vegetables for everybody because the prices are higher, because they re reflect the real costs yeah. of producing those. Do, do people in the inner city that don't necessarily have good access feel that this is a luxury sort of a thing, and that's why they're higher priced? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. at Shaker and Public Square, um, they do take EBT, SNAP, and WIC. Okay. And you're capable of sliding your card, and they give you tokens that you just can spend, and they also match. Um, they give you other one dollar tokens that match. They have a matching program. But I'm sure these people are savvy. They can see that their snap at the farmers market buys less than their snap it's at Dave. That's true, but there are like well, I also with the take, incentive um, program, it probably yeah. would be a okay, better. Okay, so it may even out. Match. And I also take senior nutrition coupons, and and those and the per the perks, the extra perks that they give are only able to be used on produce. Okay. So, and at farmer's market. And at farmer's market. So you can't actually take the, the SNAP coupons that they give to Dave's. They have to come and see me. And part, I mean, the point of do people feel like this is a place for me yeah. is definitely an important research question. And, so, and that actually will be a major focus of our new core project with the Prevention Research Center. So stay tuned, hopefully, in collaboration with a lot of people in this room will be able to uh, not just understand whether or not people feel like it's a place for them, but hopefully to build systems that would f make the places more um, welcoming, um, so if they're not already. It's a big difference to me between the farmer's markets and say going to the west side market where you're mm -hmm. kind of haggling mm -hmm. for price. Mm -hmm. where, where are you haggling? At the west side or the right west side market? Okay. Mm -hmm. They're also not local. And <laughs> so it's, it's a different kind of feel to it. Mm -hmm. And so you see people there and it's kind of a, a social event almost. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of the difference between there and some of the like markets that you see outside of Shaker. Yeah. It's more of a social event there as opposed to when you can go there and just haggle for price and you can talk about this and that. You can go two doors down and do the same thing and it's it just seems different. Yeah, yeah. No, I think the, the way that markets are structured, whether they're indoor spaces, outdoor spaces, local only, um, every day of the week, one day of the week, it, all of that influences that space and that experience. Um, so they, they really are, each one is unique in many ways, but there are some commonalities as well. Yes, uh, just a comment about his comment, and then I have another uh, uh, bigger comment. Um, for those of you who, who don't know it, all of the produce at the West Side Market comes from the same place as the produce in the grocery store. Correct. There's no local produce, except I think there's one vendor who's trying to resell some local. So uh, the, the bigger point is the lack of knowledge we have about food quality. Exactly. And as long as we as
as a culture view food as fuel. We're going to do the calculation of where can I get the cheapest fuel, right? And while we're willing to pay extra for premium fuel in our car, we're not willing to pay extra for premium food in our bodies. And we're ignorant. We're very ignorant of nutritional value when even fruits and vegetables are transported from California five to seven days in a truck is not the same thing as buying a tomato when it is ripe and picked out in the field by people who pick it by <coughs> hand because it's a different breed of tomato. So, you know, there's a very significant depth of knowledge that we've lost. And uh, demonstrations of cooking at farmers markets, of helping people understand uh, breeds of foods. Um, so when you do your calculation of you can get stuff cheaper at Dave's, it's not the same stuff, I'm sorry. Yeah. Even if it's fruits and vegetables. There are people who come to my market every week and say, well, this is too, and my tomatoes are beautiful, organic, <laughs> organically, yeah, but they're not certified that they're organic method grown beautiful tomatoes that I harvest by hand that day, an right. hour before they get there, right. and they will come there and say, well, I can, two dollars a pound for these, which I think is cheap, <laughs> two dollars a pound, I can get it for about 50 a day, and I'm like, okay, but <laughs> like, no, you can't, can. no, you can't, you right, can't and, and, it's, and people, right. and it's again, the ignorance thing, people who come there, they're like, it's June, and they're like, wait, you don't have any watermelons? I'm like, yeah. no, no. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it is definitely something that we need to teach more of. And, and it, it's a spectrum. I mean, Absolutely. comparing Warm tomatoes and tomatoes is one thing, but comparing a Snickers bar Correct. to a, any tomato yeah. is another thing. Correct. So it, it's a whole spectrum. We have, I think, one last question, probably. Yes. I think farmers' markets would be more popular if they were adjacent to a a grocery store because so many times when you go shopping you're getting vegetables but you also need to get things mm -hmm. in the grocery store and if they're widely separated it's more difficult. Yeah, I think that um, probably the grocery stores and the farmers markets don't want to be next to each other for, for you know, trying to each get each other's customers. But you're right, I mean the concern of one-stop shopping, especially if you're limiting resources time, which is definitely the case for a lot of people, um, to think about shopping here and here is, um, you know, some people that's a big barrier. So, but a lot of farmers are actually do sell a variety of products. So, all right. Well, well please join me in thank here. You. everybody for attending and your participation and again if you did sign in please do that. I uh, appreciate it. I have a very strong